So I'm going to go through week two review. Okay, It says which of the following correctly ranks the gaseous compounds in order of decreasing standard molar entropy. So remember, if you're comparing compounds and trying to decide which one has more entropy, the larger the compound, the better able it is to have disorder. Okay, So the larger the compound, the more disorderly it can be. Therefore, the greater the molar entropy will be. Therefore, your answer is D, since SiCl4 is bigger than CF4, which is bigger than HCl. And I did that based on masses. That's how I determined that. And two, it says use the data below to determine the enthalpy of reaction for the reaction of aluminum metal with chlorine gas. So I need to take these four reactions and somehow get this. And so what I do is I look at this. I'm looking for major players. So I've got two aluminums here. So I'm going to keep this as it is. Then I have Cl2. So when I look at Cl2, and it needs to be a gas. So when I look through these, I've got Cl2 right here, except I only have one Cl2. So I'm going to multiply this whole thing by three in order to get three Cl2s. Then I need to get two aluminum chlorides, but in the solid state. So I've got to take this reaction, and I've got to flip it since the solid is on my reactant side. And I have to multiply by 2. So I'm going to multiply by negative 2. Okay? And then the very last thing I've got to do is I've got to manipulate this middle reaction. Because right now, I've got 6 HCLs on my reactant side. And I've got 6 HCLs on my product side, gaseous HCLs. But I don't want any in my final reaction. So I can get rid of it by multiplying this whole reaction by 6. Therefore, my six HCl gases will cancel, and my six aqueous HCls will cancel. And so when I remember, you multiply, and if you have to flip, you multiply by negative one, and then you'll just add up your heats. And so I got A for my answer. Okay. And three says addition of solid zinc oxide, chromium oxide, to the gases shown in the reaction below causes the system to react more quickly than in the absence of it. So zinc oxide, chromium oxide is acting as a catalyst. What catalysts do is they pr provide an alternative mechanism that has a lower activation energy. Okay, and so we didn't really talk about that it provides an alternate mechanism, but we did talk about the fact that a catalyst lowers the activation energy. So C is gonna be your answer. And four gives you this reaction. Okay, since this is linear with a negative slope and this is Ellen, I know this is first order. So what must be true about the decomposition? Well, if I look at all of these, none of these answers work except for D, which says the half-life of N2O5 is independent of its initial concentration, which is true because the half-life of a first-order reaction is independent of any concentration. It will be the same regardless of concentration. So your answer is D. In 5, it gives you these Ka values. And it says, which of the following pairs of solutions results in a buffer with a pH closest to 7.4? So if I look at these Ka's, remember my best buffer is when the pH equals the pKa. So remember when you're looking at these, since you won't have a calculator, 10 to the negative second, the pH for this is going to be a little bit smaller than 2. So it'll be 1 point something, okay, because the negative log of 10 to the negative second is 2. The negative log of 1.2 times 10 to the negative second is a little bit smaller than that. Okay. For here, the pH is going to be somewhere, it's going to be a little bit lower than 8, which tells me this is the best acid to use for a buffer. Okay. So that was the first hard task, is determining which of these two is best. So since we want pH to be equal to pKa, this is going to give me a pH that's closest to 7.4. Now, what I need is I need equal amounts of HOCl and its conjugate base, which is OCl minus, because to create a buffer, you want equal amounts of weak acid and weak base. And so when I look at these options, I'm going to get rid of A and C automatically because that's the wrong acid. In B, I have 50 mils of NaOCl, which is its conjugate base, and 50 of 0.5 molar HCl. Now that might not automatically seem like the correct answer, but if you look at this, remember, if I have the weak base and I add a strong acid, I need to add half as much strong acid as the weak base in order to get equal amounts of OCl minus and HOCl. So if I do that, if I add the 50 mils of the 1 molar and 50 mils of the 0.5 molar, 
that will, once it's reached equilibrium, that'll give me equal amounts of OCL minus and HOCL. In contrast, if you look at D, since I'm adding equal amounts of the weak acid and the strong base, that will not give me a good buffer because that will cause all of the HOCL to be used up and the only thing I'll have left over is OCL minus, okay? So B is your best answer. Another valid answer would be 50 mils of one molar NaOCL and 50 mils of one molar HOCL, but that wasn't an option. In six, it says a student sets up the same chemical reaction in two different test tubes and labels them A and B. Test tube A is allowed to reach room temperature and B is at 60 degrees Celsius. The student measures a larger rate constant for the reaction test tube B, which explains this observation. So the only two valid options are either B or D, okay? A, temperature has nothing to do with orientation. The only thing that temperature helps us with is to have enough kinetic energy to overcome the activation energy, okay? C, the activation energy is not lowered. It's simply that more of the molecules are going to have enough energy to overcome that barrier, that activation energy. So your answer, the best answer is actually B, simply because in D it's talking about statistically which has a greater chance of reacting. We've never talked about that. In B, we've actually looked at a curve, that dumbbell curve. You guys had that in your notes where it actually shows you the activation energies and it actually shows that at a higher temperature, you have more molecules, a greater fraction of your molecules will have enough energy to overcome that activation energy, okay? So that's B. So let's go through these two free response questions which come directly from AP questions. In 7a, it gives you this compound, and it says determine the mass in grams of carbon in the sample. Since it gives you the mass of CO2, you're gonna go from grams of CO2 into moles of CO2. Then I'm gonna go from moles of CO2 into moles of carbon, get into grams of carbon, and so I get 0.6112 grams. In II, it wants to know the mass of nitrogen, so I'm going to take the mass of the total sample and multiply it by the percent that is just nitrogen, which is the 28.84%, and so I get the mass of just nitrogen here. In III, it wants to know the mass of oxygen. Well, I know the mass of carbon, I know the mass of hydrogen, because that was given originally in A, and I know the mass of nitrogen, so I'm just going to subtract those three from the total mass and whatever is left over, that will be the mass of oxygen, so I get 0.2035. Now, since it wants the empirical formula, what I need to do is take all the masses of the compounds, convert them into moles by dividing by each of their molar masses. Now I've got them in moles. Now I need to divide by the smallest number of moles, which is 0 0.01272, and I get these whole number values, 4, 2, 5, and 1. Remember, if it were a decimal, like 2.5, you would then take those values and multiply by 2 in order to make them whole numbers. Okay? But it worked out nicely. There's my empirical formula right there. Now, B has the possibility of being very challenging, but it really isn't. As long as you keep in mind, if you're ever giving grams per liter, that what you can do is just say that your volume is going to be one liter, okay? So I have PV equals NRT. It wants the molar mass of my compound. If its density is six grams per liter, it gave me temperature and it gave me pressure. So what I can do is use PV equals NRT. I know my pressure. My volume, I'm going to assume, is one liter because it's per liter. I'm going to solve for moles. I know my R and I know my T. So this N, my number of moles, is actually 0 0.0319 moles per liter. So now I have moles per liter and I have grams per liter. So what I can do is just divide the mass per liter by the moles per liter and that will give me just grams per mole. And so the answer I got Oh, it's 188 grams per mole, so that's the molar mass. For II, it wants you to find the molecular formula. It gave me the empirical formula, so remember to do that. You're going to take the molar mass, which is 188. You're going to divide by the mass of the empirical formula, which is 93.9. You can just calculate it from CH2Br. Then you'll get a whole number, and that's your whole number multiplier. You're going to take your empirical formula, and multiply by 2. So instead of CH2Br, it's C2H4Br2.
for eight, we're gonna go through this. It gives you the reaction, it gives you three different experiments. It just says, determine the order of the reaction with respect to each reactant listed below. So for I minus, and it says show your work. So you don't have to explain it, you just have to show your work. And so what I did was I used experiment one and two. So from going from one to two, the concentration of I minus triples, while the rate also triples, which tells me th since three raised to something equals three, that'll be one, this is gonna be first order. Okay. For CLO minus, I used experiment one and three, which might be a little bit disheartening for some people because as you notice, I simply assumed that the concentration of I minus going from experiment one to experiment three stayed the same, even though it changed a tiny bit. It went from 0.017 to 0.016, but I assumed it stayed the same. Okay, because if you were to take 0.016 and divide it by 0.017, you practically get one. So I assumed it stayed the same, but the concentration of CLO minus quadruples, the rate, the rate quadruples, which tells me again, showing this work, that it's going to be first order. So the rate law here is going to be rate equals K times the concentration of I minus times the concentration of CLO minus. In II, it says calculate the value of the specific rate constant. So I can use whatever trial I want. I use the third experiment, okay? So that's my rate. I've got my K, I've got my two different concentrations. And so when I solve for that, I got 611. It actually should be 610 to have two sig figs on reflection, so 610. My units, since the overall order for this is second order, are gonna be molar to the negative one. And I looked carefully before I wrote this, I looked at my rate and it's molar per second. So this is going to be seconds to the negative one. If it were molar per minute, then this would be minutes to the negative one. Okay. For C, it gives you a whole new reaction, H2O2, and it tells you that it's first order. So it says, first, label the vertical axis of this graph. So since it's first order and this is linear, what that tells me is that my y-axis is going to be ln of the concentration of H2O2. Okay. What are the units? Well, since this is first order, and if you look at the table that was given to you here, this is minutes. My units for my K are just going to be minutes to the negative one. And then finally, on the graph, draw the line that represents the plot of an uncatalyzed first order decomposition. So initially, at the very beginning, the, con the LN of concentration is going to be the same because it's not influenced by the fact that it doesn't have a catalyst yet. But as time progresses, the concentration of H2O2 is going to change more slowly if it's uncatalyzed and if it were catalyzed, which tells me that the slope of this line is going to be less steep. If it were more catalyzed, it would be steeper. So this is kind of wonky simply because you need to make sure that it starts at the same point because at the very beginning, you're going to start with the same concentration whether or not you have a catalyst. But then knowing that if it's uncatalyzed, the rate is going to be slower, the slope is going to be less steep than if it were catalyzed. Okay, and that's it. That's the whole problem.